Welcome to episode 667 of Salcedo Paranormal. I'm your host, James Salcedo, and tonight I'll be talking about haunted places in the U.S. As always, you can find all episodes of the show, along with links to social media and other ways to contact me at the podcast page. And that is salcedoparanormal.podbean.com. That's S-A-L-S-I-D-O paranormal.podbean.com. Always happy to hear from you all, whether you have comments or questions or topic suggestions or accounts of paranormal experiences, whether they're your own or from others that you trust. Happy to either read those or have you join me on the show to talk about them. Thank you all for listening, whether you are here for the live streams on Discord or if you listen to the podcast or YouTube feeds or on the Trouble Minds Radio Network, KUAP Digital Broadcasting. There you can hear replays of two episodes of my show every night at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, right before Trouble Minds Radio comes on. And as always, I want to thank Michael Strange, host of Trouble Minds Radio, for having me on the network and uh, putting all my shows up there. And if you'd like to support my show, there are different ways to do that. You can always share the show with others and rate and review it on your favorite podcast platform. You can find books I've written. Uh, paranormal fiction and nonfiction over on Amazon, including my most recent release, Salcedo Paranormal Experiences. You can uh, sign up for the Patreon page and get one extra episode per week of uh, True Paranormal Stories from the Web whenever possible. You can also uh, just make one time donations through PayPal. Support is never expected, but always appreciated, as there are expenses in making these shows from equipment to research materials, to travel expenses in some cases. So we are still in Colorado, uh, going through some locations there. And uh, this next one we'll talk about today um, is, and I'm probably going to say this wrong, I forget, I always forget to look up how to say things. Um, Chesman Park or Cheeseman Park in Denver. And uh, again, Please, now this is a park, so I'm guessing it's going to be open. Um, but please check out all um, information on these locations I talk about uh, on your own time. And uh, make sure that, that, find out when they're open, if they have hours and all those kinds of things, if they're open to the public or not. Some that I talk about in these shows may not be open, depending on who owns them and all that. So these articles that I share, they are, um, they are an article that was written at one point in time, and things can change. Uh, Places can shut down or open or have different schedules than what these articles talk about. So I will always include the articles in the episode description, uh, and uh, that way you can check out the full text and all the pictures in these articles, uh, because those are really neat to look at, and uh, but of course hard hard to share on an audio format show. So... Uh, This first article is from uh, hauntedrooms.com, and the uh, the title reads, The Haunted Cheeseman Cheeseman Park, I'm not sure how to say that, in Denver. I'm going to say Cheeseman for now, but anyway. So this park is um, a popular spot for locals and tourists, uh, just because it's um, apparently really beautiful. Apparently, there's 80 acres, uh, and uh, it's 80 acres large, and uh, it is right in the middle of an urban setting, and it has, um, of course, on three sides of it, there are private homes. So, it was created in 1907, but before that, the land was a burial ground, (laughs) Mount Prospect Cemetery. So, and of course, the article says maybe this explains why Cheeseman Park is now uh, reported to be one of Colorado's most haunted places and home to one of the most haunted graveyards in the country. Of course, a lot of places say that we are the most haunted, whatever we are in the state or country or world or whatever. Um, So this article goes into history starting off Uh, in 1858, it says General William Larimer, L-A-R-I-M-E-R, arrived in what is today Denver and uh, claimed the land 
uh, of course, claim the land from local uh, indigenous people. And uh, in November of that year, uh, this general designated around 320 acres of land uh, to be used as the Mount Prospect Mount Prospect Cemetery. And apparently he wanted to uh, have the most influential residents of Denver uh, to be buried at the um, at the cemetery on the crest of this hill. Of course, while criminals and the poor were to be buried at the edges. Sounds uh, really nice, anyway. <laughs> I'm saying that with sarcasm there, in case anyone can't tell. Uh, and it says ordinary middle-class people would be uh, laid to rest in the space between. So he had it all planned out. Anyway, uh, one of the first people that was um, interred in the cemetery there was uh, a convicted murderer, so, and his victim, uh, and, uh, so, this talks about the, um, let's see here, so, yeah, this is talking about the, um, the burial of this, uh, these two brothers, well, brother and brother-in-law, uh, uh, they were buried there, and, uh, of course, these, um, this area, the cemetery started to fill up, and uh, the this part of the cemetery, the, the place where, of course, poor people and criminals were buried, was known as uh, uh, locally as the Old Boneyard or Boot Hill. So, of course, this was um, this was not what Lar Larimer had intended, and um, so later on, he renamed the burial ground. Uh, city Cemetery in 1873, and uh, of course the the uh, cemetery at that point was quickly falling into disrepair. And uh, so let's see here. Talks about that. Uh, many of the families no longer wanted to be any part of the cemetery, and uh, so it was left left to. Uh, Left the way it was for a long time there. In 1874, City Hall gave notice that anyone who cared should make arrangements to remove the remains of their loved ones uh, and have them reburied elsewhere within 90 days. So apparently, the city had other plans for the area. And um, so, even though some this was um some people did do this many people did not and uh in 1893 the city made arrangements with uh a local undertaker uh to uh remove the bodies that were left and bury them in riverside cemetery so the uh of course this didn't go well the deal was not did not go through very well the, the Payments and all that. It's according to the article here. And it says that the work was sloppy, which is not what you want when you're dealing with this kind of stuff. Um, one local woman, it said, apparently warned the workers to say a prayer over the um, every time they unearthed the body. Otherwise, the dead may return. Uh, but, of course, they laughed and sent her away. Uh, so, anyway, there's... Apparently, there's some re, re, um, let's see here. So it talks about the just the way that the work was done, not with respect. And um, so yeah, this is going into a lot of history of that all that whole process there. Uh, so there was an investigation that was done, and uh, the result was that the uh, removal of the bodies was never completed, and so the holes were filled in. And uh, many bodies are still there in the area beneath the park, which was, of course, completed in 1907. So, um, and let's see here. The, uh, of course, there's a lot of reports, I think probably because of just being a, a cemetery, former cemetery, well, current 
in a way. Um, there have been reports of paranormal activity in the location uh, that they back to when, of course, this whole terrible deal was done or um, sort of when it was done, but not very well, when this process was sort of going uh, underway, but the people there were not um, not doing well with it. So anyway, uh, it says that um, one of the workmen, uh, his name is Jim Astor, A-S-T-O-R, uh, walked off the job after he um, had a paranormal experience. Uh, he said he had been, so he had, um, apparently he had been stealing brass from the old coffins, wonderful to do, again, sarcasm, uh, when he uh, suddenly felt a nice cold pressure and uh, settling on his shoulders. And he was convinced that uh, one of the spirits had come to uh, chastise him for his thievery, according to the article here. Um, so he was so frightened that he uh, he threw down the uh, all his belongings there and ran from the site. And uh, he didn't even never went back there to work again. So, which probably not a bad thing considering what he was doing. Uh, around the same time, it says the people that lived in uh, in homes surrounding the graveyard started to have strange experiences, which you do get that sometimes. Uh, there's um, apparently a there's these uh, sad and confused looking figures would uh, knock on their doors and windows. That's not creepy at all. Um, and these spirits were confused, having been disturbed by the attempted or incomplete removal of um, their the remains there, apparently. Uh, many reports have come about of people hearing uh, moaning and crying coming from the the area. Uh, so during all during that the whole process of transferring and and not being done well. It says that today the spirits are still there. Uh, there's frequent reports from visitors and nearby residents of um, things happening there in the park, both in daytime and night. And uh, many people that visit the park that have uh, described having this feeling of just being sad or having an unexplained feeling of dread uh, that seems to come from nowhere, uh, con considering the park is meant to be a fun place, and and uh, but you have the history there, which um, explains could explain why they happen. Other people say they've heard hundreds of whispering voices. That's amazing, uh, and um, and moans, of course, echoing around the park, similar to what residents reported back when. Um, the process was ongoing. And uh, one of the common sightings is uh, involves spirits of little children who were often seen playing in various areas of the park and in, in the middle of the night there. But then whenever, um, whenever anyone gets too close, they disappear. So this also happens, it says, with a female spirit who visits the park uh, so she'll basically be there and then um, then, she'll, then she'll vanish but uh, people have reported uh, that she sings as she wanders around in the park but then she vanishes once uh, anyone gets close so uh, it says there have also been reports of sightings of strange mists and shadowy figures uh, um, among the trees there, and outlines of the old headstones can sometimes be seen in the moonlight. I'm not sure if they mean apparitions of them or if they're just talking about in general. Anyway, uh, one of the strangest things the article says that has been reported is that many people that visit the park have an odd sensation if they lie down in the grass. Now, if they don't know, if you don't know what the history of the location, 
lying down in the grass in a park can be a common enough thing, I, I guess. Um, but anyway, once they do that, there's uh, there's some unseen force that comes over them that holds them down, which is not pleasant. They say that after they, they lay down for a short time, they uh, they feel as if they can't stand up right away. So that's, yeah, that's uh, quite the... I wonder if that's just, I don't know, spirits, people trying to get their attention or what that is. Uh, the residents that live in the houses that border the park uh, also say they've had experiences uh, in their own homes. So this is in buildings outside of the, the park, which was a cemetery. Uh, and this, these experiences range from shadow figures to poltergeist activity, which is that movement of objects, to uh, confused wandering spirits being apparently seen and heard. Uh, and this goes back to the 1890s when um, when this transfer uh, for, of bodies from one location to another was uh, was started. So, um, so there's also a uh, a spirit they're known as, and this is apparently a nickname of some kind. They're known as Slack Jaw. S L A C K J A W. There's many stories of um, of activity in this park, and one of them, uh, one of the most well known, is um, let's see. I'm getting to this point here in the article, uh, and these it's a nickname, and so I was right about that. And um, and apparently, one of the more talkative spirits in this location is known as Slackjaw. So. One eyewitness account of this is uh, uh, this person described this being as a male, as so as a man, a pale man. He seems to be thin. He appears to have a broken jaw. And he appears to be wearing a hospital gown um, with, um, with blood on it. So possibly what he was buried in. You do hear about that in a lot of cases. People are seen, and of course, it's it's so hard because you hear about that, but then you hear about people being seen um, in other clothing than they were buried in as well. So I don't think that's a hard and fast rule about how that's supposed to happen, but it does happen in some cases. The witness believed this to be a living person uh, when he when he approached him, uh, when when this guy approached this uh, this this witness, and apparently the spirit asked for a cigarette. And uh, he he then asked if the people had seen the um, if people were seeing the spirits. This this the spirit asked basically this person if people had been seeing them. And um, so anyway, this is uh, so basically it's a spirit having a whole conversation, and also talking about how he was looking for the men that killed him. So this is all coming from an eyewitness of what an, a spirit was saying to them. And apparently this has happened multiple times. And, um, and of course, these witnesses, a lot of cases, at first they think it's a regular living person. And um, so these witnesses will ask this apparition why he isn't in the hospital, if he should be in the hospital. And um, of course, the man will say that uh, he was thrown out because he had no money to pay for treatment. So, and then after that, he disappears. And that's when people realize that they were just talking with the uh, spirit. So, and it's, uh, of course, uh, said that he roams the park every night looking for the people that um, that killed him. So. That's the first article here. We'll um, see what we can get through in the second article. Of course, I will include it in the episode description. Um, but, yeah, so that's quite a lot of activity in this one location uh, based on just this one article here. Uh, moving on to the second article. Like I said, we'll see how much of it we get through. Uh, whatever we don't get through, of course, we will. Um, you'll be able to read in 
uh, once you find the article link in the episode description. So let's see here. I gotta open my document again because I clicked on the wrong thing. This uh, this article is from ahauntedplace.com, uh, and um, the title is Haunted Cheeseman Park. And sorry if I'm saying that incorrectly. So um, this is, uh, of course, and this article mentions again that um, this park is located in the heart of downtown Denver, Colorado, and um, talks about how it was a. Uh, it goes over some of the history that we already talked about in the first article here. So, moving on to um, to um, middle of the article here, talks about how the um, park was completed in 1907, and um, but there are still remnants, of course, there left over from when it was a cemetery. <coughs> Excuse me. It says that in 1909, uh, Gladys. Cheeseman Evans and her mother donated a marble pavilion to the park to honor uh, uh, pioneer, uh, Denver, uh, Denver pioneer Walter Cheeseman. And um, this is how the park got its, its name at that point. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Apparently, after um, all this was done, there are reported sightings of um, apparitions wandering around the location, and um, as they're searching for uh, resolution or, or peace uh, from when, again, the place was a cemetery. The, um, a lot of people in the area, uh, locals and visitors, are uh, enjoy the park, and uh, despite its the um the activity there so uh this article the second article doesn't talk too much about the um activity there it has it just mentions basically apparitions seen wandering around the location so the first article had a better description overall of uh the activity there um i may need to do a show on why cemeteries and graveyards some appear to be Really peaceful and have no activity, and others just seem to be um, to be active. And I'm not just talking about this location here. I think we'll um, we'll just end with with all this here. Um, I think that's, that's a sort of could be a good topic for a show uh, at, at some point. I don't know, but because um, it's true, a lot of places there are people that say that the the cemeteries or graveyards they go to are really peaceful. And others, they say, people say, they don't like to go to this one or that one. And the reports of activity, you can get places that are either known for having a good or bad feeling where there is activity or where there is not activity. And it's just a feeling that people get. So I really wonder how that works. Uh, I have no idea. But, um, but yeah, these, um, it's really doesn't surprise me that this place that was a was a cemetery that is now a park, and especially having that sort of a, a sloppy, disrespectful sort of transfer process, and even a partial and incomplete process of moving the remains of people from that location to another, doesn't surprise me in a way, just based on how often, how common it is for there to be reports of people that. Um, once their 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 grave is dist disturbed, they they show up again. Doesn't surprise me that 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 kind of activity is reported there. So, anyway, that's all the time we have for this episode. Thank you all for listening, and I'll talk to you all next time on Salcedo Paranormal. Take care.